Hello and welcome back to part two of the history of British video games with GIFGAF and the National Video Game Museum. By the year 2000, gaming was getting bigger. 3D games were hugely popular and everybody was getting in on it. One of the things that's become really interesting with the sort of mainstream availability of fast internet connections was the, the possibility of creating uh, not just online games that you can play against a you know, small number of people, but massively multiplayer online games. So things like RuneScape were hugely, hugely popular. Gaming doesn't have to be a solitary experience, and with RuneScape, it truly wasn't. The first big British MMO game arrived in 2001 and changed the face of online games forever. And it's still being enjoyed by hardcore fans to this day. There was quite a significant amount of people who were using the internet to feed their gaming habits. The concept that gaming had to be done locally was thrown out of the window. For a lot of people, Escape was a glorified chat channel. They were still chatting to their friends. They just happened to be fighting goblins or uh, defeating dragons and rescuing princesses. There was definitely a shift away from that kind of arcade game, which was you know, shorter. You play for you know, you keep, you keep on playing it, but you play for just a few minutes at a time, and you gradually get better. To these really deep, immersive worlds, I suppose. You cannot talk about the history of British video games without mentioning Peter Molyneux. Repeatedly. I think Peter Molyneux's games are kind of classic. Oh, I'll just, I'll just have one more go. I'll just stay on for another like half an hour, and then you realise the sun's gone down and come back up again, and you've missed an entire day of school or work. The mastermind behind Populous and Dungeon Keeper was back at it again in the 2000s with games like Black and White and Fable. Fable was a role-playing game that gave you the freedom to play as a hero or a villain with tough moral me. decisions to make. Please help! I hurt. Ow. I hurt. It brought British humour into the world of games like no other game had before it. It was an instant classic. Give me your hand. room for more than just RPGs. Little Big Planet hardly had a story, which made it entirely different to anything else available. Instead of following a set path, players could create their own levels. There's lots of ways in which players have always made sort of new games out of the games that are given to them. Things like Little Big Planet really start to kind of walk towards that and say, actually, here's a game development kit and then you can make the game that you want and share it with other people. That gave them plenty of opportunity to showcase their creativity and imagination. The game gave birth to a whole new genre. Everything that's always excited me about games and still excites me about games is that no, you know, nobody knows what they are. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So you might say games to me and you think of Pong and yeah. so this person thinks of GTA and this person <laughs> yeah. thinks of Manhunt and this person thinks of Angry Birds. What they can be is changed and reinvented mm -hmm. when somebody does something particularly kind of different. Mm -hmm. And nobody owns what they are. No. Right? Which is a really exciting thing. Consoles are great, but they've got one significant flaw. They're very big. Fortunately, in the 2010s, you can game anywhere at any time with one of these. The 2010s are when mobile gaming becomes a thing. And now, even your grandparents are sending you Candy Crush invites. It was really the iPhone in particular and the App Store um, that sort of transformed mobile gaming. But this idea of a device that you already had with you that was also a gaming device. Everybody has a games console in their hand. Yeah. Every parent, every mentor, anybody who would guide somebody into what career they're going to be getting into, they can relate to, oh, okay, you're going to go into video games. Oh, yeah, I played. They Candy can Crush. understand. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Candy Crush Tiger is, is, is such an interesting game. It's the sort of style of game that's been around for a long time. There's something about that particular game, it just sort of caught the zeitgeist as much as anything. You then have politicians you know, getting filmed, secretly playing it while they're supposed to be making important decisions about the government. Pretty much unlimited access to mobile gaming has changed the landscape quite a bit. Thanks to this, independent studios have a chance yet again to lead the way. So us two is Monument Valley. Mm -hmm. Amazingly, it's yeah. beautiful. You know, as I kind of famously stated, every screen should be able to be printed out, right? Yeah. 
use of colour, through use of pace, mm -hmm. it absolutely just created this other audience. Yes. Yeah. Right. It's really important for us to make sure that we appeal to people who don't necessarily have a brilliant uh, amount of games literacy, but have a lot of cultural literacy, have a lot of curiosity about the kind of experiences that they could be having on their phone. Something that's really great, I think, in the last maybe 10 years or so, indie studios and the amount of uh, variety that we're starting to see now in the types of games that are actually being made. I think every single large company uh, and developer would love to be that small indie developer because they can innovate, they can experiment, rather than just follow the set formula of what is a sure hit. With Monument Valley, we ended up throwing away about 90% of the ideas and the content that we came up with um, in the early stages. We'd rather spend more time and put more attention into polishing up the content that we do have and making it feel like a really um, beautiful kind of transportive experience. The cost of developing games, AAA titles are astronomical, mm -hmm. but really you can develop a mobile game quite easily these days. When you've got more diverse range of people, you just get richer ideas and I never think that that's a bad thing. Not only did mobile gaming create a world of new possibilities for smaller, independent studios, it also introduced new audiences to gaming. 51% of gamers are actually women now, and a lot of women who play mobile games won't consider themselves gamers, but yeah. in the grand scheme of things, mobile gaming is one of the biggest um, facets of the industry right yeah. now, and it's just kind of very interesting to see the narrative and the definition of what a gamer is change yeah. over time, I think for the better. New technologies and new audiences mean that gaming is always changing. There are plenty of stories yet to be told and we cannot wait to see what happens next. The most exciting thing is going to be when a eight-year-old girl from Canuck completely blows the roof off what we thought was possible with video games because video games as a platform where people can express themselves in the same way as we all learned to play the guitar when, you know, when I was at school or the piano, it becomes a natural place to, 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 to express ideas and stories. And that's the most exciting thing. The revolution is going to come somewhere completely unexpected. Looks like that is it for now, but there are so many more exciting games to come in the very near future. Thank you guys so much for joining us on our journey through decades of British video game history. Thank you to GIFGAF for making it possible and give the National Video Game Museum a visit because it is genuinely amazing. We'll see you guys next time.